see. Hello, are we on live? Yes, okay. So I want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Sam Sunshine, and we're at OC Sports and Wellness, and we're a family and sports medicine practice here in Foothill Ranch, California. And I have a, an awesome guest, someone I've known for quite some time, and we've worked together for years. Um, and I'm so happy and thrilled that you're here, Steve. Uh, this is Steve Holmes. He's a clinical nutritionist. And today we're going to learn about food and how important food is for our health, why the standard American diet's not the greatest thing for us, and what are some what you know what are some healthy diets. So if you can hear us, and you're and you're watching live, if you don't mind commenting in the chat box, so you can hear us okay, and maybe even putting your your first name and where you're from. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Steve Holmes again. Again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and educate our audience today about the importance of food and what a clinical nutritionist does. So give us a little bit of your background and how you got interested in becoming a nutritionist. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This, this is very fun. This is going to be a good time here. I'm, I'm enjoying this. I enjoy nutrition. I've been doing this uh, nutrition work for, for 40 years. I've been working in clinics like this over the years. I've uh, helped with uh, dietary supplement manufacturers, working with them with new products and design and regulations. I've designed nutrition programs for some sports teams. I've also worked very closely with people at the Food and Drug Administration on dietary supplement regulations, which is, is extremely important. Nutrition has been my life uh, for, for over 40 years, as we mentioned. It's always interesting and exciting. Nutritional science is constantly evolving, and as you mentioned earlier, over the past 40 years, things have changed so much. Diets have come and, come and gone. New diets are being developed. Old diets have come back and been renamed, but it's changing, and changing for the better. And a lot of research is going on with diets, new dietary modalities, and with, with supplements as well. So it's a very exciting field. And uh, I'm just happy to be part of it. Great. Okay. So again, what you, you kind of gave us a little bit of your background. You've been doing this for a long time, and that's why I like working with you because you you're very evidence based. There's not a lot of evangelism, um, but it's just basic. You know, what are you talking with patients, getting to know their their diet history? So, what do you see as your role as a nutritionist? in my office, which is an outpatient clinical setting, um, and how you work with doctors like me to enhance the, the care of patients? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. And, and I think that my role is to help you with your time. Doctors are so busy. Their time is very limited. And a nutritionist can help you. I help you. I feel I help you. Um, by spending time with the patient, reviewing their diet diaries, that to me is really critical. We have to know what they're eating. I want to know what they're eating. I want to discuss in detail with them what changes that we can make to help them with their condition. Do they need more protein? Do they need more fiber? Do they need less sugar, less fat, or a different type of fat? Do they have food sensitivities? Uh, the nutritionist really frees up your time, but we also help develop dietary supplement programs, which is to me very critical, a big part of, the, of their health program. But it frees up your time, I think, so that you can spend time with them on other issues like blood chemistries or hormone balance or whatever. So it's taking the detail work away and you can spend time with them with other things. I think that's very critical yeah. in, in an office. Yeah, and I know in a conversation I had with a patient this morning, and we talked about how easy it is with electronic health records and um, you know, can, the technology, we can prescribe a medication for a condition in 30 seconds. Right, yeah. But to get a diet history and then break down what people are eating, their frequency of meals, uh, yeah. The macronutrients and micronutrients, and come up with a plan to improve their diet. That can take a lot of time, it and that's does. where you come in. Yes, yes, and I think we need to really train the you know medical students and the residents in all all aspects uh, and all subspecialties on the importance of what we eat. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
Well, that's that's a good point, and and uh, I guess I could ask you a question about that. How much time in medical school did you spend on nutrition? How much back when you were in medical school? Yeah, so I did a partial, like a one year into a master's program in, in nutrition. So that is always interests me. Mm -hmm. But I decided to yeah. switch over and go into medicine when I got accepted to medical school. Um, but most of what I've learned about nutrition has been self-taught and we get very little. Yeah. I mean, we get very little and it's usually one lecture that's three hours long that you cover every study on nutrition and it's not applicable. Like it doesn't give you how to apply what you learn about the Mediterranean diet and the keto mm -hmm. diet in clinical practice. Right. So it's like, okay, that's all great information, but how do I utilize that information? Yeah. And that's the tricky part. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Because they say it's easier to mm -hmm. change religion than it is to change <laughs> diet. I love so it. So you, when you get a patient, how, how long does it take you before you realize this patient's willing to make changes or this patient's not? And how does that change your approach? Well, that's a good question. I think it depends on, on the patient, of course, and, and their condition. Um, some patients are easily motivated and they're, they're, they want to make changes and they, they're willing to do that and they know that they have to do that and they know that, that nutrition and diet are part of that. I think because of who you are in your office, I think that's why patients like to come in, come in and see you for sure. But some patients are easily motivated and I might see them a couple of times and they're off and running and, and they do well. Other times, uh, it, it takes a while. And you may have to see them every uh, every couple of weeks for a while before they really get get the hang of it. But uh, it, it's uh, it's not easy to change your diet, but it, it can be done. And uh, um, I see people doing it, and I see them them uh, uh, achieving their goals when when they do make these changes. Yeah, yeah. it depends on the patient and. and uh, and their willingness to, to make change. Yeah, and you talk about goals. Everyone has different goals. What are some common patient goals that you've seen over the years that uh, I know we've talked about this before that patients want to achieve well, or strive to achieve? Um, to me, diabetes is a big problem. And for diabetics, lowering their blood sugar, their hemoglobin A1C, their HOMA IR scores, uh, are the important issues. That seems to be the, the, the goal. Some of the patients don't understand some of these these terms, but they understand blood sugar. They know that. So if they can get their blood sugar down, that's a very important to them, for sure. For some people, it might be lowering um, blood lipids, like cholesterol or triglycerides. Or some people want to have more energy. Some people, their goals are to sleep better. Mm -hmm. Or reducing weight. That That's a... Yeah. That's a that's a real goal for a lot of people. I recall one patient here in this office, um, Bob, we'll call him Bob, who was diabetic, and he wanted to uh, get better, reduce his blood sugar without taking any drugs. That was his goal. That was what he wanted to do. So I work with him every two weeks for, for quite a while with uh, dietary adjustments, we added a few supplements, B vitamins, chromium, cinnamon. Uh, and uh, he made some significant dietary changes. And he got his numbers down. It, it took a while. It, it wasn't a quick fix. And we have to remember that nutrition is not a quick fix. It's not, it doesn't, nutrition doesn't work like a drug. It's not fast like that. It takes time. So he was willing to make these changes slowly but surely. And over a few months, he did see his numbers come down. So he... He achieved his goal without using drugs, just with diet and nutrition. So it can yeah. be done. So I think that's a good point. You know, it's, it's not a quick fix. I love that. And also, you know, what are we measuring? So a lot of times we've added a body composition scale. So mm -hmm. we can look at body fat percentage. We can look at skeletal mass, which is your muscle mass. We can measure your labs. So we can look at your blood sugar. We can look at cholesterol, which mm -hmm. is linked to heart disease, as is blood sugar. We can measure blood pressure, mm -hmm. and that gives us an idea. If you have high blood pressure, that's another, another major risk factor for heart disease. And we know that there are dietary changes you can make to lower blood pressure, lower blood sugar, lower cholesterol mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff is online, too. But again, I see patients, and we just don't realize that what we eat 
affects us oh, on a cellular level. Oh, it does. Can it, you it, talk a little bit about well, it? it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you and I have talked about this, and it and certainly can. Certain foods can uh, can change our, 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 the way our genes function. It doesn't change the gene. We can't really change that. But we can change the way the genes function. If we, if we constantly bathe our genes with bad nutrition, with fatty foods, sugary foods, fast foods, processed foods, the genes are going to function differently. They're going to function poorly. We're going to be in bad health. But if we constantly bathe our genes with good nutrition, good food, with a few supplements, good quality food, then, then our genes are going to react that way. They're, they're going to, our health is going to improve because our genes are doing the right things. They're healthy genes, are not unhealthy genes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we're not going to, we're not, it's not the genes we're wearing, but genes are segments of DNA <laughs> yes, that code for proteins right. that help cells communicate with each other. That's right. And so it's again, you know, the certain foods, healthy foods turn on good genes and yes. turn off bad genes and unhealthy food does the opposite. Yes. So yes. it's almost like food is information. Well, it certainly is. There's no question about that. Uh, and we process that information just like a computer processes information, but we process it, process that information that we feed it. We feed the body good food, it's going to process good things come out of that. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, you bring up a good point. I think that the, the better the quality of the food, the, the, the better people really feel. And it takes a while for some people to, to realize that. It takes them maybe a good part of their life. And they come in here and they're feeling really lousy and they wonder why. But it's years of, of poor quality diet that, that can do that. Yeah. And we know that uh, the standard American diet, which we'll touch on next, is um, one of the reasons why the United States is the leader in chronic illness like diabetes, cancer rates, heart disease rates. Obesity. Obesity. Mm -hmm. yes. Can you maybe uh, add to that? Like the standard, what, well, how, the standard why, American diet. Why do they call it the standard American diet? <laughs> well, that, that's a good question. I don't know why they call it that, but if you, if you turn it into an acronym, which we do all the time, it's SAD. That's what it is. It's right. standard American diet, diet is SAD. And it, and it is a SAD diet. But that's what, uh, <laughs> I don't know who coined the phrase, actually, standard American diet, but, but it was a good one. Uh, but a standard American diet really consists of what? Fast foods, sugary foods, uh, processed foods, foods in a box, foods in a package. That's not the way we should be eating. We should be eating food that comes right out of the ground if we can do that. That's the best way to do that. So, uh, yeah, the standard American diet is, is causing a lot of health problems in this country. Like you said, our health... We spend more in healthcare than any other country in the world. And yet, if you look at, at the quality of our health, comparison to other countries, we're way down the list, 10th or 11th, depending on what, what's the, what the data bank you look at. But we are very in poor health, yet yeah, we spend more money in healthcare. So there's something really askew there. Yeah. And I think it has a lot to do with the diet. Speaking about that, when you go to any other, many other countries, if you go to Italy, you know what food you're going to get. You know you, the type of food you're going to eat. If you go to Japan, you know the type of food you're going to eat, or India. But if you come to the United States, what's the food that people think of when they come here? Hamburgers, French fries. It's fast food. That's, soda. that's right. Fast food. That's right. That's what we're renowned for. You can get dead animal any time of the, day, right. of the day or night. Yes, right. you can. That's exactly right. So let's yes. talk. Okay, so the standard American diet, high in fat, high in sugar, highly processed. Yes. And would you say highly addictive? Ah, that's a good question. And uh, I think it is. In fact, there are some studies I saw years ago looking at sugar and how addictive sugar is. So the more sugar you eat, the more addictive you addicted you are to sugar, so you, eat, you keep eating more. And I think all of that standard American diet food, that junk food is like that. It's very, very addictive. And I think that the flavorings and the chemicals that the food processors put in there kind of force that, that, that honest, that, that addictiveness on us, yeah. on, on the human. Sure. And I think they're, it's, a, it's a device they use, or a platform, or it's a protocol that they know they can 
um, make it taste a certain way that makes us more apt to come right. back for more. That's right. They, that's what they want. They, they don't really care about the nutrition, most of them. I shouldn't say that for all those companies, but food companies, but most food companies don't really care about the nutritional value. They just care about if it tastes good and will you come back to buy it. That's what, that's what yeah. they want. Yeah. Okay. All right. So one of, the, one of the questions that's coming in is, what's the healthiest diet? <laughs> Boy, that's a good one. Uh, well, if you look at the current medical literature right now, the Mediterranean diet seems to be in favor. It's, it seems to be, if you, and it's always at the top of the list, it seems like, lately. Uh, but some people think the ketogenic diet is the best diet. Uh, for others, it's a plant-based diet. Maybe it's the diets of people living in the blue zones, uh, which is a very interesting topic to discuss. Uh, the blue zone, blue zone diets vary from region to region. They're not all the same. And there's seven or eight of them around the world. Uh, Italy, Greece, Okinawa, Japan. Uh, Loma Linda here. Loma Linda, California. Uh, Costa Rica, there's a, a part of Costa Rica. So there's seven or eight of them around the world. And the common denominator there for these blue zone diets is that they're mostly plant-based diet, mostly. Not always, not vegan diets, but mostly plant-based diets. The Loma Linda uh, blue zone area is certainly a vegan vegetarian diet. That's because of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist religion out there. So they are vegetarians. So that that is why their blue zone is so healthy because they don't eat any meat. Most of the other blue zone areas, the meat is very restricted. It's mostly a plant-based diet. And the other common thing about the blue zones is that there's no, they don't eat junk food. It's not in their diet. It's not there. Yeah. Fast food, sugary food, they just don't eat that stuff. Yeah. So I don't think there is any one perfect diet, one best diet. We're also unique biochemically that you can't have one diet that suits everybody. You have to maybe make a hybrid, take some part of this and this and this to suit each person's biochemical uniqueness. Yeah. So I don't think one diet is, is best, but certainly the Mediterranean diet has some good research and the people living in the blue zones, they're, uh, they can attest to that because they, they live long and they live healthy. Yeah, and, and that's the kind diet, of what we want. And the diet is a big role, plays a big role yeah, in that and for sure. What's interesting is we know that eating healthy gives us energy, makes us feel better, maybe reduces joint pain, headaches, can affect our mood. And yet we tend to gravitate, again, probably because of the addictive nature of certain foods to the standard American diet. And I think a lot of people don't equate what they eat with how they feel, mm -hmm. how they think. Mm -hmm. And there just it seems to be a disconnect. Well, I think there is, and f foods, foods can make us feel good, but foods can also make us feel bad without us really knowing it. Foods can be somewhat inflammatory. Some foods can be inflammatory. They can cause inflammation. Maybe it's a different food for each individual person, but some foods will cause inflammation. Like if somebody has an allergy to, to dairy, for instance, that's going to cause an, an inflammatory process or an allergy to something else. So another type of food. So we know that foods can cause inflammation and inflammation is, well, the root of all of our diseases. Yeah, all basically. Chronic, these chronic diseases, yeah. like diabetes, like cancer, like heart disease, right. Alzheimer's disease, right. which are now the leading causes of, of death in the United States. And most of these are traced back to poor dietary habits, mm -hmm. lack of exercise, right. poor sleep habits, right. too much stress. So again, this is, this is great stuff. And again, hopefully you guys are taking your notes um, or taking notes on what Steve is giving us. Just really uh, um, excellent, excellent uh, information here. And so looking, um, you know, we're kind of, we've kind of talked a lot about, you know, d diet and how important food is. Hippocrates was quoted as saying, let food be thy medicine yes. and medicine, medicine thy food. And we, We've talked a little bit about how food is information. Food can turn on inflammation. It can turn off inflammation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes. So there are anti-inflammatory foods or pro-inflammatory foods. And these are things we can measure in our blood, not standard, but interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, which are specialized tests. 
that we don't get routinely. Right. Um, but there are some things that say, yeah, your cells aren't functioning normally, and that's the high blood sugar. It could well, be high blood pressure. That's an interesting point because that gets back to one of the original questions about what role does a nutritionist play in the in the family practice? Because you can look at the lab work and you can identify those inflammatory markers. You can tell that to me, so I can make up a diet for the patient that's anti-inflammatory in nature. So we can talk to the patient about this, saying, you have inflammation going on. These foods may be contributing to that. Maybe we should reduce or get rid of these foods and add these and see if we can reduce that inflammation. Yeah. So it's a big deal, for sure it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So again, any questions out there in the audience? Again, if, you, if you've joined us, please uh, let us know you're here. Type in your name and where you're from. So here comes a question, Steve. It says, um, does, you know, you talked about how diet can infect our, our genes or DNA, can turn on and turn off inflammation. Can our diet make us more prone to developing SARS COVID, COVID-2 or the, or the COVID-19 virus? A, can well, it make us that, less resilient? That's very appropriate now, isn't it? And uh, yeah, I, I think it certainly could. We know that that certain foods can suppress immune function or immune cells. We know that vitamin C um, uh, is a very important nutrient to helping to rev up um, white blood cells and uh, the immune system. But we also know that foods containing a lot of sugar can actually suppress or slow down those white blood cells. So we know that food has an effect on the immune system for sure. And then foods that that may be uh, high in vitamin C or zinc or some other nutrients that can also help the immune system. So we know that nutrition plays a big role in immune health. So we can uh, help the immune system by eating better quality food or we can hurt the immune system by eating high fat or especially high sugary foods, which would, which would cause the immune system to slow down and not react accordingly to whatever it is. It, right now it's the SARS-CoV-2 virus, or it could be anything. It could be Influenza. flu, it could be, sure. it could be a cold or whatever. All of these things where the immune system is involved, diet could play a role in that. And nutritional supplements really could too. In fact, I've heard uh, our good pal Dr. Fauci talk about uh, zinc and vitamin D as part of the protocol for fighting COVID-19. So we know that supplements play a role here, and we know that food can play a role. So that's a very good question and very timely at this point in time. Okay. So yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, and when we look at the numbers, you know, we talked about the standard American diet, and we look at the numbers of total cases, um, I think it's, uh, I'm not sure of the exact number right now, the total cases, but it's 36 million cases. And in the U.S., it's almost eight million cases in the yeah. U.S. It's just under like a, a quarter yeah. of the cases are in the U.S. and we only represent about four to five percent of the world population. Right. And in terms of deaths, there's been a million deaths roughly so far from, mm -hmm. from uh, COVID. In the U.S. it's 217,000 deaths, which again is about a quarter. Right. So and we have four percent of the world's population. Yeah. But Something's 20, wrong. 25 percent of the, of the cases and deaths. Right. And could you say it's our poor dietary habits? Well, I think that has, I think that plays a role. I, I'm not sure it's the only cause for sure. I think our cavalier lifestyle may be contributing to that too. That's lack of social distancing, lack of social not distancing, wearing distancing, masks, right, like us right now. Yeah, like us right now, exactly. <laughs> well, you were tested, we were both tested we were both before tested. we came. That's right, we were both tested, yes. Um, but yeah, it, it, diet can have a role. It's, it's, I wouldn't put my finger and say that's the only thing, but it certainly is a contributory factor. The better our diet is, the more likely we're going to have a healthy immune system. Mm -hmm. Easily, easier to fight off some of these infections that, that are coming around. And this won't be the last. This is not the last one for sure. There's so many things that are going to come before us in the next few years. This is just one virus that happens to be out there, but there's, there's going to be more. Mm -hmm. So the more we can do to help keep a strong immune system, the better we're going to be. And yeah. diet plays a big role, that's for sure. And then maybe you can touch on, you know, as you talk about immune system 
how obesity affects our immunity. Because we, uh, we have a fairly obese country. Yeah, we, it, it is. It's growing. It, it's an epidemic for sure. That's a good question, and, and you probably have as much information on this as anybody, but uh, fat cells play a role in, in immune health for sure. And of course, the bigger we are, the more fat cells we have. That could contribute to an inflammatory problem as well. So we know that, that obesity presents all kinds of problems and not just being big, but also um, with immune health, stress on the cardiovascular system, mm -hmm. everything. Sure. So, so when you say big, you're talking about more just too much body fat. Yes, too much body fat. Okay. Yes, too much body like fat. Like a bodybuilder. Well, that, yeah, that's, that, that, that's different. They, have, they probably have very little fat and a lot of muscles. But, and that's what we want. But yeah. Yes, but yes. Yeah, so we do know that fat cells called adipocytes make pro-inflammatory cytokines. Yes. So they're, they're cells that are actually very active in, in our metabolism mm -hmm. and our, on our health of our body. And the more of those fat cells or adipocytes we have, they tend to muck up the system. And how do we get those fat cells? By, by poor quality diet mm -hmm. and poor quality lifestyle. And maybe eating too much. Well, eating too much. Consuming eating calories. over consumption, for sure. And uh, under nutrition which means that you're, you're consuming way too many calories, but those calories are not very nutrient dense. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they have a lot of calories, fat, sugar, but not a lot of nutritional value there. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's great, great information. And it's very true, we eat very, the standard American diet is nutritionally poor. Yes. And we really wanna be eating nutritionally dense food. Yeah. So, you know, low sugar, low yep. trans fats or processed fats, yep. low salt or yep. sodium. But it's not nearly as much fun eating broccoli as it is eating french fries, is it? That's a good point. <laughs> but I think what you could do, it's mixing things together. Well, yes. The potpourri. So do you ever teach cooking classes? Uh, I haven't done that. I've given some recipes to people, for sure. I've yeah. never taught any cooking classes, but I have provided recipes. Cause I, do, I do a lot of cooking at home. I try we, my wife and I both cook and, and uh, we'd rather do that than go out. We know that the best food is in our own kitchen. So uh, we, we go out periodically, but we still get the best food in our own kitchen. So we do a lot of cooking and I provide some recipes to people and give them some tips for sure. Yeah. People are a little, a little afraid of that. Some people are very afraid of cooking and I've run into some patients like that. Oh, I can't cook. I don't want to do, I can't do that at all. But if you give them a few easy things to do, then they can, they, then they can get into it. Yeah, it's it's very scary for some people to do that. But yeah, along those lines, because there are a lot of people who uh, maybe live alone or they just don't have time to cook. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about? What do you think about some of these foods that get delivered? They're like prepared, but they're not cooked, and they come with all the yeah. ingredients, and you mix them together. Yeah, there's a lot of companies that do that now, and some of them are some of them are fairly nutritious, and some of them are just so-so. Okay. They're, they're just more for convenience and uh, for people, but some of them are, do have nutritional value. Some of them, some of the companies do put some thought into it, uh, but people can do that on their own too. They can prepare food uh, ahead of time and you could separate it out and freeze it in small batches. Mm -hmm. You can do that with like rice and beans and things like that. So you don't have to you don't have to cook a lot and eat it all in one or two days. You can separate it out and do that. It doesn't take long to steam up a few vegetables. And if you have other things already prepared, some rice and beans or whatever, it, it, it warm that up. It, it's, it makes it a little easier. Yeah. So there are some tips like that that, that people like to have. Yeah. yeah. And I think really a take home message is, you know, um, eat real food. Yes. Mostly plants. Yes. Not too much. Right. And that's a quote from Michael Pollan um, yeah. that we keep on our front door right now. And that's, uh, that helps me when I have, you know, 30 seconds to educate people about their diet. Right. <laughs> but, uh, you right. know, if you are interested, we'll kind of wrap things up. But if you are interested in um, uh, learning more about nutrition and you want to um, use Steve as, as somebody, a resource, um, you can certainly make an appointment with him. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you? 
probably the best way to do that is, is to contact the office here and uh, ask them to set an appointment. Um, and if you want to do that, they can tell you how to do that. And then they will send you some paperwork if you want to see me. Uh, a food diary is probably going to be the first thing. I always look at that. That's really important. And some other questionnaires that we can uh, have you fill out for us. That's the starting point. And then, then you can come in here or we can do telehealth if, if we need to do that. That's, that's done as well. So either way, we can do it either way in the office or through telehealth or phone, whatever. Um, but we want to get to know each other. You want to get to know me. I want to get to know you. And uh, then we feel comfortable with each other. And then I know what you're doing, know what you're eating. Then I can make some suggestions on how to change that best suited for your your specific needs, whatever health condition that you may be dealing with right now. Yeah. So thanks again for joining us. Again, we work as a team, so we discuss patients uh, back and forth. So we, we feel that that team approach is more effective. Again, what you put at the end of your fork are the biggest decisions you're going to make in the day. And choose wisely. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Steve. It was Good. really a, an honor to have you come. Thanks for having me. And we'll have Good. you back on maybe some future episodes as Good. well. So yeah. if you have other topics that you would like Steve to discuss, please let us know. Thank you so much. I'm going to click this twice.